We're pleased to have with us Tracy Wilkins. Tracy is a native of this area. She's the NBC News 4 Bureau Chief for Prince George's County, Maryland, so she knows this area well. Um, this is home. She has a, a very, very illustrious career ranging from reporting in Mississippi to North Carolina, then back home here. A lot of involvement in local nonprofit and uh, volunteering activities, and a familiar face, I'm sure, for many of you. So thank you, Tracy, for being with us tonight, and I'll turn it over to you to introduce our panel. Thank, thank you. you. They were appreciated. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the museum. I'm so excited to be here. I don't, is, is this a first time for anybody else? In the audience, it's my first, okay. I'm totally circling back. This space is so beautiful and incredible. We've done stories on it and we watched the construction, but I'm in the county, so I hadn't had a chance to get down here yet. And I was like, wow, even when I drove by, I was like, wow, that's a beautiful, oh, that's where I'm going, great. So, um, so this is great. Thank you all for having us here uh, today. And, and we're gonna have a conversation about something that's really important. And the whole idea here is to have a dialogue to learn more about policing, how it's working in our communities and how technology is impacting um, the policing that we're seeing every day. So uh, this is about predictive policing, forecasting crime with Big Data National Law Enforcement Museum, putting this together for us. So again, give them a round of applause for having a good community discussion for all of us to learn more about technology <laughs> and how it's working. So I just want to start with a brief definition of uh, predictive policing. Uh, you know, it reminds me a lot of like the precogs in um, Minority Report, right? And we saw that in that movie there were some glitches in the, in the precogs, um, but then, you know, there were some incidents that came across, you know, the way that they were supposed to when they were policing them in the movie. But, you know, now we're living in an age where technology can kind of do the same thing. And that's a lot of what um, is going on with predictive policing. So just a little bit of a definition here before we begin. In November of 2011, Time Magazine named predictive policing as one of the 50 best inventions of 2011. In the United States, the practice of predicting policing has been implemented by police departments all across the country, including Los Angeles, including Chicago. We're going to have a conversation about that in just a bit. But predictive policing, according to the National Institute of Justice, is the application of advanced analytics to data sets in conjunction with intervention methods. It's very technical. It's not a replacement of traditional policing models, but an enhancement of existing approaches. So to help us in this conversation, we're joined by Professor Andrew Ferguson. Um, he is a national expert on juries, predictive policing, and the Fourth Amendment. He currently teaches and writes in the area of criminal law, criminal procedure, and evidence at the David A. Clark School of Law at the University of DC. His most recent book, The Rise of Big Data Policing, Surveillance, Race, and the Future of Law Enforcement, examines how surveillance technology and predictive analytics shapes modern policing. Please, everyone, give Mr. Ferguson a round of applause for joining us today. Reverend Tony Lee is the founder and senior pastor of the Community of Hope AME Church in Hillcrest Heights. He is, um, the community of Hope is recognized throughout the region for its innovative ministry, social engagement, and community outreach. The congregation has also gained national attention for its work around HIV AIDS, violence prevention, community police partnerships, and educational advocacy. And I can tell you as the Bureau Chief for NBC4 in Washington, we spend a lot of time at this church when we're dealing with community issues. This is one of those hands-on churches, so it's really great to see you here, Reverend Lee. Thank you for joining us. And Jonathan, uh, Chief Jonathan Lewin is, um, he oversees the Bureau of Technical Services and serves as Chief Information Officer for the Chicago Police Department, the second largest municipal law enforcement agency in the United States. He has been a sworn member of the CPD since 1991. He has also detailed to the position of Managing Deputy Director for the City of Chicago Office of Emergency Management and Communications for four years. His portfolio includes surveillance cameras, gunshot detection, mobile platforms, voice and data communication systems, license plate recognition, geographic information systems, predictive policing, and business intelligent functions. And as you can see, we've got the folks here who we need to have here uh, to help us out in this discussion. We're going to begin with a video that Chief Lewin has uh, made available for us. So let's go ahead and start with that video. The Strategic Decision Support Center 
is a district-based, high-tech nerve center that ties together operational intelligence from a host of sources. SDSC personnel use data analysis and technology tools to provide insight for decision-making. A geo-based mapping system provides situational awareness. Crime forecasting software identifies areas that are most at risk for violence, and gunshot detection sensors enable officers to respond more quickly to shots fired incidents. Field officers are now equipped with mobile devices to receive information from these systems in real time. By surfacing patterns in the data, the SDSCs enable commanders to deploy officers more efficiently. The analysis centers on locations prone to violence and on repeat offenders. Once the people and places most at risk are identified, SDSC personnel develop mission parameters based on available resources. After the commander has made the final decision on where to focus attention and the actions to be taken, the missions are disseminated to field units. As field officers complete their missions, they collect data and intelligence that's transmitted back to SDSC personnel for analysis and inclusion in briefings, providing a 360-degree feedback loop. By constantly analyzing what has been most and least effective in this iterative mission-based process, solutions are constantly being evaluated and optimized. The ultimate goal of the SDSCs is to provide a process and an environment for collaboration and analysis, resulting in fewer victims. Strategic Decision Support Center. Smarter policing, fewer victims. All right. So I'd like to begin my questions with um, Chief Lewin. And, you know, uh, just looking at the video, we're seeing these officers and they're looking at computers and they're in a room. And the first thing that I think is they're away from the community in a room. So what happened to walk in the beat and how has technology impacted that good old fashioned common sense policing? Well, the first point is that it, it does not replace it, it enhances it, it supports it. None of the technology is ever going to take the place of people. It's never going to replace human intelligence, human intuition. It just helps inform that. Uh, computers are not, none of these models are magic. They're not doing anything secret. It's just that the computer can go through a lot of information much more quickly than a person can. And in Chicago, we have so much data so much information, so many cameras, so much sensor, so many sensors providing input, all this real-time information that we decided that we needed a place where that could all come together and be acted upon. So those officers that are that are staffing the rooms, and there is also a civilian in the center. Uh, for the first time, we hired civilian criminal intelligence analysts. Those officers rotate in and out of the room, so they're in touch with the community. They're on the street. They're also in the rooms. It's kind of a rotation. Uh, so does not take the place of that. Just helps uh, empower it, enable it, inform it, and we think make it more effective. When did Chicago start predictive policing? Can you talk a little bit about the history the department has of this? We started with a person-based risk model, which we called, and it was a terrible name, our strategic subjects list. List is in the name, but it wasn't a list. I was doing a talk show with uh, with the ACLU at, at one point a couple of years ago, and the the rep from the ACLU said, "Well." You know, this, this is this is a list. You know, you've got people on this list, and I said, well, it's not really a list. And they said, well, then how come list is in the name? So that was kind of tough to to counter. So one thing we did is we changed the name. Uh, we're now calling it the uh, Subject Assessment and Information Dashboard, I which the professor along. brought along. So <laughs> I knew he was going to bring it up. Uh, so list is not in the name. We started this uh, a couple of years ago. I think the first, and these are all Department of Justice uh, grant funded initially from the National Institute of Justice, now from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. The, NIJ, the first NIJ grant was, I believe, in 2013, uh, and we've developed, we're now on our, this is basically our sixth model of the person-based prediction. This just rolled out. January. January, so the professor knows. Uh, all of our orders are public, by the way, so uh, this is in the interest of transparency. If you go to directives, chicagopolice.org you can find this order and all the other policies and orders um, so that that was the person-based prediction we started place-based prediction in 2017 you know when I hear person place prediction uh, place prediction uh, I'm thinking okay so we have computers 
and computers are doing this work. And my question is, who's programming the computers? What's going into the computers? How is that working? Professor, can you jump in here on uh, the question of bias and how that plays into having computers that are helping with the policing in these communities? Sure, and, and just to step back, I mean, what you see in that video is really a revolution in how policing is, is going forward, and you're doing it in the, in the beginning. And whether good, bad, scary, brilliant, it's really changing where police are going on their daily basis. It's changing who they're interacting with and who's on this, uh, I still call it the strategic service list, the heat list. Uh, and it's changing a relationship between police and, and communities. And it's something that we should be having a conversation about, which I'm glad we are here, because of issues of bias, because of issues of transparency, and because it's actually just changing policing. And we should be thoughtful about how technology will change that officer who's in the patrol car looking at their smartphone, just like the smartphone has changed every one of us, how it's going to change them, and asking questions of, can we trust the data that is coming in here? Uh, are we sure we've set up metrics and measures to make sure it's accurate? Are we concerned that bias could find its way into the system? And then how we check. And so to get to your question of bias, so one of the uh, earlier models of this sort of person-based predictive policing, right? this idea that we can identify individuals who are more at risk for violence, either as a, a victim, like someone who actually might get shot, or as a perpetrator, someone who might do the shooting, um, was using a, a series of inputs, and right, you got to be careful with your inputs. And some of those inputs are arrests, and right. So in the early iterations, they had arrests for uh, narcotics, uh, gun violence, weapons, as well as whether you've been a victim of a violent crime, uh, your age at the last arrest, and kind of this trend line was going up or down. And some of those variables in Chicago are imbued with. Uh, r a racial cast, right? Chicago has an unpleasant history of race. The Department of Justice Civil Rights Division went in there and wrote a report that you guys are still working with on the consent degree about some of the structural racial problems there, right? And so if some of your inputs are arrests, and arrests are kind of proxies a lot for where police are patrolling and what they're doing, you have to worry, and you have to take steps to make sure that you're not just sort of reifying it. Now, when you're intentional about it, and when you're thinking about it, this can do a better job of identifying those people who are most at risk, right? Risk is not evenly identified, evenly spread out across society. There are people who uh, more, are more at risk, and they tend in Chicago to correlate with communities of color and poor communities. Um, and so it's complicated, uh, but it's also something that deserves like a sustained conversation to make sure you are not just simply taking the fancy toys, and it looks really cool, uh, and, and really interrogating how do we get this data has a community been bought, brought in? Do we understand uh, how it's going to impact how the officers are seeing their community? I can talk some more about how I, as a law professor, how I see sort of the law changing. Uh, but I think it, it is important to recognize that underlying that data are concerns about bias. Doesn't mean it's racist. Doesn't mean it, 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 it should be thrown out. But it means that there are hard questions to be asked. And you mentioned um, the and the communities that this this kind of work would really impact. So we're talking about uh, communities of color, we're talking about social economic issues in some instances. So Reverend Lee, I have to ask you, when you hear analytics and you hear we're basing this on crime statistics, do you also hear the possibility of over-policing in communities like a Hillcrest Heights where your church is located? In? Well, I, I hear a couple of things. Um, one, over-policing. Two, um, I have questions, concerns about what it deals with uh, this kind of slippery slope of reasonable suspicion. Um, that if the computer says mm -hmm. that you may be suspicious before you've actually done something suspicious, then th th then it, 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 it is a whole slippery slope there that's very dangerous. And I say that uh, having been a black man in America um, who, when I was in seminary, was in New York City um, and had gone one day to get some chicken from the chicken place. It was cold. I had on a big coat. And I was walking back up Broadway, 125th and Broadway, because I was at Union Theological Seminary right up the street from Harlem. And, I'm, and some gentlemen, some police officers, plain clothes, jump out of a car, snatch me up and slam me up against, start patting me down. And they feel the chicken and scout gun, and I holler, no chicken, chicken. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, just really, just, just like, no chicken, chicken. And at that point, I realized I had to use any connection I had to white privilege. And I had to say, I am a student at the Union Theological Seminary. If you go in my pocket, you will see my identification. It's in my right pocket. Now, what I remember most about this was, this was during the period of stop and frisk in New York. 
effort. It was a new kind of a policing kind of an effort. Um, it was having, um, and for some it was a great kind of a thing, but for some communities it was just terror. And so here I am, this master's student in seminary, and I remember, the, I'll never forget it, remember the officer saying to me, once they saw that, who I was, all right, you go ahead, and next time, don't act so nervous. One, next time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Right. Yeah. And two, how am I supposed to feel about four white men in plain clothes jumping out of a hoopty, you know, <laughs> slamming me up? I had to do, like, arithmetic. I had to do, you know, calculus in my head and say, either I'm getting robbed. If I'm getting robbed, I'll just get robbed in public. But if I run and they are police, I'm getting shot. Um, that kind of a piece. The reason I say that is because, and what they said was, we got a report that it was a black man in a black coat. Right. Okay. This concept of they could just run out, jump out of me. I had done nothing suspicious. I, I, I was just walking up the street. But because I was a black man in a black coat, close enough to Harlem, then that made me suspicious enough to get snatched up, slammed up, and have to worry about and do this calculus in my head about how to stay alive. Um, that is what con is a big concern for me when now it won't just be them, but it can be a computer back <laughs> at headquarters that's saying in that area there are black men in black coats um, or, or, you know, th there's uh, some extra crimes there. And I can just be walking up the street, but I become the suspicion of me jumps up um, and the ability to jump out on me is now quantified. So that then when I'm arguing in court, they had no reason to come and jump out at me. They said, well, no, the computer said. Right. And okay. it allowed us to then send other folks. Into, and so that's a big concern from a community standpoint. Which is a segue into law, and I want to discuss that. But, Chief, I want to bring you back in and ask you a question about this, because there are um, – two sides to this argument. Some saying it's best that officers don't have too much information because it can influence how they react in the community, it can influence who they're arresting and whether they arrest them or whether they give them a warning and let them go. And then there are others who say give as much information as possible so that the officers can make the right decisions in the field. Where do you stand in this in this discussion of how much is too much information well first I think it's fitting that we're having this conversation in the National Law Enforcement Museum because if you walk through the exhibits you'll get a sense of history and the history of policing and you'll determine that these kinds of techniques these kinds of strategies have been used since the days of Sir Robert Peel all the computer is doing is doing things faster again if the if the four of us got together and said what do we think are the risk factors for somebody to be involved in the cycle of violence you would probably say if somebody's been shot that may tend to increase the risk that they would get shot again you might say if somebody started their criminal activity at 10 years old that probably increases their risk a little bit <coughs> if somebody has been arrested and charged with a weapons related offense that probably increases their risk those things all do increase their risk. And to the Reverend's point, this is not a, an enforcement tool. The, the person-based model is a, it's an intervention tool to try to work with social service providers to get people out of the cycle of violence. To the professor's point, he's right. Unfortunately, in Chicago, as in many other big cities and other places in the U.S., most of the violence is very concentrated in areas of high poverty. There's a cycle of violence. Today's victim is often tomorrow's offender. Chicago has a very entrenched criminal street gang problem with many criminal gang members that commit violent crimes. This model is designed to save lives. The reason that we developed it is to try to save lives. The reason that we developed and implemented the technology that you saw in that video was to save lives, and we've saved lives. That technology, which really focuses on place-based prediction, not person-based prediction. In fact, this is probably the last version of this model that we'll create. There's, a, there's probably a level that you're going to reach with the data that we're allowed to use, and there's all sorts of privacy controls in place. So there's, there's some data that we can't use. But the data that we just talked about is objective measures of arrest, objective measures of victimization. If you've been shot, you're a victim. Unfortunately, that increases your risk for being victimized again. This is probably as effective as the model is going to get. What I think needs to be focused on now is what do you do with it and how do you intervene to save lives. So on the person-based side, we're really, in, in many ways in the police department, shifting the focus to place-based prediction, which I think there's still a lot more potential for, using a variety of inputs to come up with place-based risk models. And one last point is this is not a list. This is a risk model. 
everybody has some level, some level of risk. Everybody in this room has, has some risk. I have risk, you have risk, you have risk. Some people have higher risk, some people have lower risk. All this model does is say, these people have come to our attention for the following reasons, and the model indicates what those reasons are. They're at increased risk for violence. Is there something that we can do to try to save their life? That's what it's about. And so your feeling is the more information, the better. The more information an officer has on the street, the better. So, so there's a couple, couple caveats to that. One is that the information has to be actionable, so it has to be useful and consumable to the officer. You want to stay away from information overload where you're giving them too much. One of the things we learned with our Strategic Decision Support Center project, which is what the video is about, is there has to be a very consumable, actionable tool for the officers to react to information, <coughs> both uh, strategically and tactically. So for example, we've got smartphones in their hands. We can't push too much information to them or it's going to be overload. So it's meaningful information on things like shot spotter, which detects a gunshot event and directs them to the location. That's a critical life safety event that they need to know about. The risk model is where should they pay special attention to because we think that this geography might be at risk for future violence. That's pushed out to them. Obviously calls for service, things like wanted people, wanted vehicles, that's all pushed to them. It's not all information, and there's a lot of information that we can't use for a wide range of reasons, but allowable, actionable information that makes a difference to make them more effective is what we should use. Um, Professor, let's talk about the law, uh, or the courts, and how this is impacting what happens with sentencing and, and what the Reverend brought up. Can this kind of technology make its way into um, an attorney's, into a state's attorney's office? So, so generally speaking, this kind of place-based prediction or even person-based prediction doesn't necessarily make it directly into court or even the prosecutor's office. What can happen is if you are put on this, if you're given a risk score and not on a list, uh, and you're high enough, you actually might be called in by the state's attorney to a community meeting at a church or a community center to essentially be told, like, you all are on this list. We are identifying you. There are services to your left. There's prison to your right, choose wisely which path you take, and the consequence can be that if someone then makes a mistake and gets back into the system, the consequence for the prosecutor, could they could bring you know, harsher penalties or harsher sentences or those. So it's indirect. There hasn't been that many, there haven't been that many cases involving like a hotspot predicted place and a stop based on that prediction and that becomes a litigated Fourth Amendment issue. But it is, to your point earlier, distorting some of how officers might see their area, right? So you can imagine if you have your smartphone and you're told to go t following like a Hunch Lab tip, Hunch Lab's one of the companies that do it, and you're following, you're told to go to this area to be on the lookout for burglaries because there's a predicted likelihood there'll be more burglaries in this area at this time. As you drive in that neighborhood, you're gonna be looking for burglars, right? Because you've been told to be on the lookout for this particular crime at this particular time. That can have an impact on how you see the world, how you see the community members who are in this world, and how you might see uh, reasonable suspicion as you brought up. But there are interesting things you can do with the technologies. For example, one of the experiments that Hunch Lab is running is it used to be that they literally, in their early, I don't think it's in Chicago necessarily, but in their earlier uh, computer systems, you would literally be driving in your squad car and the colors would change on your, uh, your iPad. So you'd be driving through a high aggravated assault area and then you'd go into a high burglary area and you'd go to a high theft area and literally the colors would change. So you know it. And so you'd be looking for whatever that next thing was. And I think what Hunch Lab has done in some ways is actually sort of blind the officers, like still nudge them in the right place, but not necessarily tell them why, because they were worried, because people like me were criticizing them, about <laughs> that, that this is going to distort how you see the world. So technology can still add, and if you're an officer, you might <coughs> feel two ways about this. Actually, you're not being told all the information people do know for your own benefit, which is sort of, you know, I don't know, that's above my pay grade, but like you actually are putting people in the right place at the right time, but not necessarily creating the same distortion as I have critiqued that that could affect, you know, Fourth Amendment suspicion and the rest. I have a question, and um, Chief, you can jump in on this, or Professor, you can jump in on this. I would imagine that if you are looking at a computer that's telling you where to go for, let's say, there are a lot of shootings in this area, there are a lot of homicides, I would imagine that as a chief, uh, managing my resources, I would put my officers who I believe could handle that kind of situation the best in those areas. And I would also imagine that if we're dealing with other kinds of crimes, quality of life crimes, or some of these other things that officers in that vicinity may have to respond to, if they're looking for shootings, how would they respond to those kinds of things? And, and so it's, I guess it's another information 
overload question, but is that what happens with well, officers? Is that how so, you manage so them? So one thing about the model is that it, it is creating areas that the model thinks are most at risk for violence, just like the subject prediction risk model. This can be overridden by people. So this is an input, and I just want to make one point to the professor's comment earlier. Um, so what he's talking about is, is we call it a gun call-in, where uh, criminals who've been arrested and charged with gun crimes are essentially called, called in, literally called in, and they're on uh, probation. And they're told if you commit future violence, you could be subject to enhanced penalties. There's also intervention services, et cetera. But the critical point here is that the risk model the the the, uh, the model itself is just one of the ways that you get prioritized for that call in and in fact there's six or seven other ways that are all based on people's intuition and people's assessment so it is not the computer saying you're going to be called in instead the computer is making some suggestions people review it along with a bunch of other information and say okay we think this person is at incredible risk for these reasons this person should be warned they should be notified so it is the model is not the only thing both on the person-based model and the place-based model is not the only thing that is making the recommendations it's just one of the one of the inputs into this overall decision process and it's really we call it a special attention so it doesn't mean you're going to flood that area with resources doesn't mean you're going to pick certain officers that are better with violent crimes and send them there it's it's a special attention what i believe is so the model changes its geography three times a day whether it's predictive or not what i can show is that it's increasing what i call mobility so i can prove that the officers are moving around more now partly because we're tracking where they're going more, we're paying more attention to how much time they're spending in certain areas and what they're doing when they're there. So even if these are not the greatest areas of risk, which maybe they're not, they're at least causing the officers to change their, be more mobile, uh, increase presence in more areas of the geography, and I think that's making a huge difference. And we can show, and RAND is actually doing an evaluation funded by Bureau of Justice Assistance of the impact of the SDSCs, which won't be published for a while, but based on the preliminary results, which I'm allowed to talk about, it is going to show a significant positive impact of the SDSCs on crime reduction. Robert Lee, let's talk about wraparound services. Mm -hmm. In your church, you do a lot of work with exactly <coughs> what they're describing about finding folks who either have been through the system, have been incarcerated, or there's a potential that that's where they're going to go to come into that space and get the assistance they need. How crucial is this kind of information and um, for that kind of work? And do you feel like that should be just as much a part of this policing dynamic as um, the police having this information, that it's important for the community to also have access to it as well? Well, and, and, and I think we have a model of it in Prince George's County. Um, in Prince George's County, we have what's called the Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. Um, TNI was a way, and it really actually came out of the police department, but then was housed under the county exec and kind of housed the county government. Um, but what it was was that they were looking at this kind of data, um, but uh, realized, and this is the chief saying it, that they could not arrest themselves out, out of, of the crime, crime issue. Yeah. But there was a need to be able to utilize this kind of data and utilize data, big data in general, and look at neighborhoods where there were issues, but not just do a typical hotspot initiative in which you just sent police, but do the kind of hotspot initiative in which you sent services. And not just the kind of services in which you brought people into a room and said, hey, choose this or this, but the kind of services in which you use data um, as a county. It's a way of re-looking at government. Um, in which it doesn't cost more, it's just reallocating resources. It's being able to look at government, being able to say, okay, in this community we got these calls for these needs, whether it was needs around social services needs, whether it was needs around um, the trash cans didn't get picked up in time, and then being able to utilize data as a way to then route to whatever government resources to make sure certain things could happen in those communities. And what we watched in Prince George's County, um, they actually did a press conference at my church about this kind of community policing relationships um, is that we watched the crime across all levels in seven years drop 50%. It's at a historic um, low in Prince George's County. It's had some of the low. lowest drops in the nation yeah. um, with the yeah. work that they were able to do. And they yeah. said that T and I had a lot to do with that. Yeah, and, and, and we felt that. On, so my, my church is smack dab in the middle of two hot spots. 
So when I first came in, we saw the hot spots, Hillcrest Heights, Suitland, we're right there. We're inside of a shopping mall, so you know, we get everything. <laughs> um, and, 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 but in that, as we started working with the police, we, and it allowed us then to also see what the police needed. And so then the church was able to do community walks with the police. I, 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 the church would buy the ice cream truck, walk with the chief of police through the community, and we were giving out free ice cream so the community could have interaction with the police department and non-confrontational kind of settings. And then we developed this kind of relationships that ended up paying dividends in the long run. Um, but I really believe that, so I believe technology is helpful. I believe it's important, but I believe it needs to be connected to more than just policing. Um, but if you look at it and you look at it being shaped to other government services and other care providers, et cetera, faith, community, social, et cetera, um, then I believe that it can have the kind of impact that we've watched in Prince George's County. Chief, I have a question for you about um, officers who are tied to their computers. So I have a two-part question. Um, you were talking about the officers moving around more, but they're not on foot. They're you know, in their vehicles. Primarily, yeah. I have heard and from chiefs of police, there are, you know, different ideas about whether it makes sense to walk the beat and if that's what people still should be doing, officers still should be doing, or if it should be more about that relationship with the computer. So the first part of my question is, how important is it to have the beat officers who are going door to door, who are, you know, meeting people in the community as opposed to being stuck to those computers. That's critically important, and to the Reverend's point, this none of this replaces community policing. That is, that is a central part of, of what we're doing and what every department should be doing. If you walk just a few steps down the hall here, you'll see a uh, community policing exhibit at this museum, and Chicago is one of five cities that's featured there. So we have a strong community policing program. Are there, is there room for improvement? Of course, just like in any program, there's room for improvement. We don't want officers having relationships with computers. We want officers having relationships with people, with the community. And to your question about foot officers, of course, of course you want to do that. You want to be going door to door. You want to get to know the community. In a huge geography, uh, Chicago is almost 250 square miles. Not as big as LA or New York, but it, it is still a huge geography. Uh, some of our busy districts, you would need a lot of officers. Uh, we have added a thousand additional officers. We're at 13,002 budgeted strength now. But even with that number of officers, you still have to have officers in cars that can cover geography and be able to respond to calls. But of course, you want officers on the street walking around. Tell me, <clears throat> and I just want some inside gossip, so please be honest with me. How difficult was it when you all started to introduce this to your officers? I mean, what, what did you have older officers who felt like this isn't the way you police? Yes. And exactly. Okay. So, and how much of an issue has it been for the younger officers who are coming in and the older officers who are there to help train them? The the different cultures coming together to get this work done. So I'm going to quote my superintendent Eddie Johnson, who says, "There's two things officers hate: change and the way things are." Mm -hmm. So some of the officers love it, some of them hated it, but once they started seeing that it was making a difference, and I think the, 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 the way that I knew that, that, it, that they had bought into it was when our police union, the Fraternal Order of Police, featured uh, two officers on the west side of the city in the 11th Police District, Garfield Park, they featured them and the SDSC Center in their monthly publication, which I asked them for permission to use and they gave it to me. They allowed me to use it. But we don't get to control, of course, what they publish. They choose whatever they want. And they chose this program to feature. So once you've got the union support, once you've got the officers buying into it, they see that it's making a difference. They see that it's saving lives. 1,400 fewer shooting victims from 2018 versus 2016. 2016 in Chicago was a terrible year. We had 768 homicides. Something had to change. If technology can play a role in helping us save lives, I think we have an obligation to use it responsibly within legal parameters and with the appropriate controls in place. But I think we have to use it. Professor Ferguson, uh, I want to ask you about um, what you see as the biggest concern here for the community. And, and well, so let me frame the question differently. I feel that it would probably be important for the community to be in on these conversations about what's happening with this. How can folks insert themselves into this conversation and make sure that the decisions that are, are being made with this kind of technology, that they're not excluded from those conversations? Well, you know, this is a question that every city will face, and I, in my book I sort of pitch this idea that before we adopt these technologies, there should be sort of democratic oversight, right? We should make sure that the city council knows what we're <coughs> using taxpayer dollars for. We should have uh, an open uh, hearing where people have to, the chief has to defend, like this is why we put 30,000 surveillance cameras in this area. 
can today count as my hearing? No, I no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, recognizing it will be difficult. And recognizing there are going to be community groups that are going to be uh, frightened of this. Recognizing that the ACLU and other uh, civil liberties suits are going to uh, um, point out the concerns. But you should have to justify. You should say, look, we think putting 30, is it 50,000 now? I can't remember what it is. 50,000 surveillance cameras that are networked in these, these community uh, areas is worth the resources because those that money could be used for libraries or after school programs or other things. We think this is right. This is why we think it. There are too many people dying. This is why we justify it. And we want to be able to have that sort of political openness where you sit there and say, we think that this you know, strategic subjects uh, ranking list, say, said list, uh, said no non -list, list, no, no longer list. list, is important. And again, you have to get past the concerns because the flip side response is, if you are on this list, not a list. If you're on this list, this non-list, you get a threat score. Like it's literally a number that's attached to your name. And so you might, it's from zero to 500 plus. It's no longer a number. It's a okay. risk tier. All right, last so we year. Took the number we that, right? But again, but this is what was scary. And this is what, this is, this is not a bad thing to change, right? <coughs> the, the original idea of um, when it was called the heat list, I can say it, was a creation of a bunch of sociologists and, and data scientists in the academia who said, you know, Chicago is a special place because the shootings are uh, in small groups of retaliatory uh, 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 communities, and it's really like kind of a public health issue. Like we can almost see that if you were living next to a, you know, cancer-causing plant, like maybe we should deal with the underlying issue. And violence was thought of as a public health approach. So this is how it began, became, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the variables have changed over time. But there have been moments where the variables and the way it's been done has, I think, needed a bit more discussion, right? And to me, one of the things that worried me was at a moment where you were using threat scores. Like if you got pulled over, <coughs> like literally on the dashboard, you could see the score. If you were at 500 plus or whatever it is. Not in the car. It, it wasn't. Officers did not use that when they were driving around on the street. Oh, well, okay, right. And, 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 it, and it resulted in knocks on your door, right? By detectives. Um, not by said, detectives. Or by not social service providers. Social service. So and, and the point I, I just have to interrupt for one second if I can. So the point I've got to, to reinforce here is that this is a an intervention tool. This is not an enforcement tool. No longer a list. There's there's not a numeric score anymore. These are things that, that, that the model has evolved to. And I, I really hate the fact that we're focusing on this model because this is a tiny, tiny part of a very comprehensive crime control strategy that is showing results and saving lives. And frankly, the, the heat list... We learned some lessons, and we did some things that we shouldn't have done, and, and we corrected them, and we're transparent with the model. It's, it's available publicly. Uh, we are, we're showing the variables that are in the model. This is grant-funded. It's designed to, to try to improve what technology can do to save lives. And again, if there's a way that, that police can use information that they have that has been used for, for centuries to more effectively, more objectively, and more strategically intervene to reduce the likelihood that somebody's going to be shot, we have an obligation to do that. And I agree with that, and I think you should say exactly that to, this is your question, to the community. And say, this is why we think we're right. And maybe we took some missteps here, and this is how we changed it. And like, everyone should do that, right? You shouldn't be bought into what you did wrong, and you should recognize this is what data does. You change your model when it doesn't work. And you change your inputs when it's, you, it's called out as maybe a problem. And that's a good thing. But my point is that the conversation we're having now is a good conversation. It's changing and you're, you're moving forward. Um, but those conversations will happen in Baltimore, in D.C., in Philadelphia, other places that are going to adopt these models. And we should have a moment where the people who know and know that this isn't some scary mini minority report. It's actually something far more boring and far more basic. But that's a good thing, right? And it's about identifying young people so they don't die, which is a good thing, right? But that conversation can be had in an open way. And my idea is that we should bring the community in before because if you go to the first hearing about this, we will spend the whole time talking about Minority Report and scary threat scores, <laughs> right? We will, because yeah. it's that part of every conversation, right? But if you get down to the, gr the ground of it, there are, this is about risk. It's about identifying risk in smart ways. And there are smart ways to do it, and there are dumb ways to do it. And there are ways to change to get to be a smarter. And like that's the conversation we should be having. But I think it should be a democratic conversation and a public conversation. And so my push is not we shouldn't do it, is that we should be doing it in a, a way that we don't have to 
keep changing the models, although I'm sure we will keep changing it, and we keep doing the best that we can do um, with the information we have. Chief, when you meet with other chiefs who are watching what you all are doing, and you get together and have conversations about how this can work in other districts across the country, mm -hmm. what are they most concerned about? What is it that they're watching and waiting to see perfected before they bring it into their own communities? Well, with the, the again, there's, there's not a ton of talk about the risk model, and you kind of hit on it, on the person-based risk model. Chicago has a pretty unique uh, set of crime characteristics, and, and this, another point that you kind of alluded to is that this this work with this this uh, this network of risky people actually started with Dr. Andrew Papacristos, mm -hmm. who at the time was at Yale. Unless you have somebody who started it before. No, no, he's doing. Do. So, he's yeah. still. So so his idea. model was just making connections across people that have been arrested together and showing nodes that have had a lot of connections, thinking that those people might be the most important in the network to intervene with. So this is not new. He was just using kind of co-arrest to to connect people together. So what we started thinking is, could this become more predictive instead of just analyzing what's already happened could it become proactive and predictive so that's where that's kind of the the uh, the history of the predictive model for people based what a lot of departments are interested in now that we talk to around the US and even around the world uh, is more the strategic use of all the information sources <coughs> like surveillance cameras gunshot detection place-based risk models the daily intelligence cycle which is a really central part of our strategic decision support center process uh, an integration platform that ties all this together mobile technology those are the things they're interested in and what they're really concerned about is cost that's what I was about to say yeah that, that's <laughs> the, it's money yeah because yeah. They, they already have all that information and it's it's this model and this lit quote I almost said it myself <laughs> this <laughs> risk score like is uh, yeah it, it's scary because people don't understand it right. once we start explaining it, it is kind of mundane it is kind of boring there's only a handful of variables in there it's not magic it's not this this secret thing it's it's pretty straightforward uh, people are are really excited about all the other all the other stuff like how do we tie together technology and data that departments have had for a long time to make it more effective cost is really the biggest concern uh, Reverend Lee, what do you say to your parishioners? What do you say to the folks who come into your church for wraparound services? When there's this kind of information out there, what do you say to folks to prepare them to take care of themselves, to protect their neighborhoods, um, for mothers to protect their sons, who may be high on what was once a list and is no longer a list? What do you say to folks to help them prepare for the onslaught of information that's uh, available now to come into these communities? So I, I think it's not as much what I say, but it's bringing the chief out to say what did they, what does the police department say? Um, I believe these kinds of conversations are the kinds of, no matter what I say, uh, the reality is uh, when you talk about predictive policing, I feel like I've been dealing with predictive policing most of my life. Um, it's been predictive. <laughs> um, <laughs> One no, variable. Maybe yeah, two. Yeah, a couple <laughs> of variables. But uh, I mean, and, and so with that then, when you're talking about predictive policing and even these models, I think there is a need to sit down and have a conversation and hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I, I do think, though, and I jotted down a piece, I, I, I do think, though, that even in the predictive model with computers, um, that I do think we still have to um, have these conversations, not just with the community, but with police officers here in community hearing concerns. So I was blessed, um, Professor Chris Marsh, the University of Maryland Department of Sociology, um, with the Prince George's County Police Department again, uh, they've done this implicit bias training. But they've utilized um, physiological, so they take them in and they go through this virtual reality piece and they got all these probes hooked up to them and they're able to show them um, the, the, their responses and how their responses may be different for different people in the same situation by their heart rate and by kind of how things play out. And that is important because then it helps the police officers say, you know what, I may have some implicit bias. I don't have necessarily overt bias, but deep down because of whatever, I may have some implicit bias. And it's good for the officer to understand that as the officer then goes out and it helps him be a better police officer, I believe. Um, with this computer piece, um, I'm concerned about implicit bias as well. So I understand that the whole not list is, you know, to help keep people from risk, and I get that. I'm concerned about the place-based stuff because if place-based says that cars are being stolen in this area um, at a high level look out for a car thief and I happen to be walking by a car with a screwdriver mm -hmm. now I could be walking with a screwdriver for all kinds of reasons but because the officer is thinking about car thefts then 
whatever implicit bias they have connected to now computer kind of predictive bias, then that can cause me to have a situation that now, and I'm not saying this to say that the, we shouldn't use technology. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. It's too late for that. Um, you know, it's just too late for that. I am saying that there need to be conversations, there needs to be training, there needs to be community connected with police. Police need to hear from community in ways that they understand their fears, their concerns, um, and what we've gone through with police. The community can hear from police to understand their fears, their concerns, and how, at the end of the day, all you're trying to do is help the community be better and help people to be safe. And I believe when we have these real conversations, then that's how we can move forward. But I believe if we don't have these conversations, then it allows us to have blind spots that computers can't get us by. Chief, what is the next step in this technology? What's the next level? You talked about starting with people, you've moved to places. What's next? All right, so how much do we want to scare you, Professor? <laughs> uh, I got another book to write. All right, so <laughs> it's probably in this book already, but it, I mean, it, policing often doesn't have the money that other industries have. So you're going to see things advance more quickly in other sectors. Police are usually catching up just because we don't have the kind of money that other spaces have. So where it's going to go is AI, artificial intelligence, and you're seeing that already in, to some extent. One example is, and this will hopefully be a very innocuous kind of uh, non-scary, Example, but you can tell me if it's scary to you or not. So here is the example. So we I'm have, scared already. You're scared already. <laughs> so we have we have 35,000 and growing surveillance cameras in the city. So more than any other city in the, in the U.S., the second uh, biggest would be New York, who has about 6,000 right now. So we have all this, and they're all in the public way. So nobody's looking into somebody's bedroom window. These are all on the street. So we have all this video content, but we do not have 35,000 people watching these cameras. So analytics eventually will be able to help us determine, is there something happening that maybe somebody should look at? Because we're looking at some cameras, we're just not looking at all of them. So could we detect some behavior that's outside the baseline. I am not talking about real-time facial recognition, surveilling people as they're walking down the street. Yeah. Not talking Yet. about it. Not Yet. talking about it <laughs> ever. Yeah. Not now, not ever. Right. Uh, a, for privacy yeah, reasons, most importantly, and B, because the tech won't be there. Yeah, but what we are talking about is, is there some indicator of some public safety issue that somebody needs to look at that could be maybe two objects colliding, like two cars crashing into each other, maybe somebody falling down, maybe somebody tripped and fell and, and hit their head on the pavement and needs EMS, needs medical assistance. Maybe people are fighting. Maybe it's, there's some indicators of people fighting. We're not talking about using personally identifiable information at this point or ever. We're not talking about facial recognition. We're talking about indicators of behavior that could be a precursor to some emerging problem. So, and people are doing this anyway. Again, it's like all this other technology. So, Reverend, you brought up the point about a risk model to come up with areas that it might be predicting uh, car break-ins, vehicle thefts, and then the police might use bias in policing those areas. The one point I would like to make is that this same technology is th this technology is not doing anything new. It's just doing it more efficiently. But hundreds of years ago, people were developing pin maps and saying, okay, I'm going to draw this area that you need to focus on today because there were some maybe horse-drawn buggies that were stolen in this area 200 years ago or whatever. So this is just making it hopefully more objective, more effective, more predictive, uh, more accurate. But it's not doing anything radically new. It's just enhancing things have, that have been done. And police have a lot of tools, including the use of deadly force. You want them to use all those tool, tools in a, in a constitutionally respective way, in a non-biased way. Uh, so across the board, police should not be using anything in a way that biases anybody. When does this go too far, Professor? At what point do people need to rise up and say, enough is enough? In your mind, when would you say this has gone too far? We need to back this up and, and change the direction. You know, I think it's a hard question. So imagine what you just said, right? So there are 30,000 cameras in Chicago that if there's a hand-to-hand -hand transaction could record as an automated prompt, want to see what that is? Is that a drug deal? Is that just someone shaking hands? Whatever it is. Um, you have an ability to track back when something bad does happen, <coughs> someone gets shot, whatever it is. You can follow the cars back and see where people went, right? You've created essentially a time machine that's an incredibly powerful investigative tool. 
on one hand, you say, that's terrific. That means there will be no uh, crime in the city of Chicago. I'm sure that won't happen, but you know, it'll be easier to solve. People will know that. On the other hand, you might say, that sounds a lot like a sort of big brother surveillance state uh, where we can't do other things, like the people who will go protest, or people who want to say, we don't like the police, or the people who will say other things will be chilled because we will be watched. You also have to ask where are these cameras being put. They're usually being put in poor areas places without the sort of political will to push back, and that could change, I guess. I'm sure there's downtown, too, that they, they have That's it. where most of them are. Right, right. Um, and in Manhattan, too, like all mm -hmm. the nice part of Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, yeah. all covered. But again, like, that's a debate. Maybe the citizens of Chicago say, we're okay with this. We're willing to trade off our security for uh, this invasion of privacy. Or maybe they say, we don't want that. There is actually a difference between an algorithm picking where you go that isn't fully trusted and the pushpin map. Like both are doing similar things, but there's a difference to it. Uh, and it's a difference worth having a conversation about. It's not automatic. And again, my whole thing, I don't know what the answer is, but I do want communities to be engaged in the questions. Because I think w this is my fear. This is sort of the story of big data policing is that it has eventually, it has pretty much been pushed without a whole lot of interrogation, in part because police have a job to do. There are people being killed right now in Chicago. No offense, but hopefully not. But you know what I mean? Like, there's, like they don't have time to think about the all of the, the <laughs> they don't have time. I mean, things are happening in real time with real issues and real cases. You don't really have time to sit back like academics do and think about all these issues. But many times the first iteration of anything is not the best you could do and that we should be having these conversations to keep improving and recognizing that we could do it. Same thing with, like, you have this uh, literal time machine. When do you uh, want to put checks on it? Maybe you don't want it covering, like, outside the abortion clinic or the immigration place. Maybe you don't want it in a place where there's First Amendment issues. Maybe you do. I don't know. Um, those are conversations to be had, and you could actually come to some uh, uh, agreement, I mean, not full agreement, but some sense, like, this makes sense to us, right? But what tends to happen in all these cases is that it just gets rolled out, and they're thoughtful, like you guys are putting in your own rules, you're trying to think through it, but the conversations aren't as broad or as big or as deep as they should be. And that's all I'm pushing for, is to actually have those kind of conversations at the front end, because you know, I can, we can talk about LA and the mistakes they made, we can talk about the early iterations of, of some of these relative of other technologies, like persistent surveillance flying over Baltimore without anyone telling that there was a camera with, with literal ability to see all of West Baltimore at one time and could was listening to the p the police radio runs and hearing all the crimes and then wrapping up the video of the crimes and saying it to Baltimore without anyone telling the mayor or the chief of police or the city council or anyone that this was going on like that's a mistake you actually could have an honest conversation about whether you want that kind of technology I don't actually know what the citizens of Baltimore would say maybe they'd be okay with it maybe they won but it seems like that's up to them and we should be having these conversations so I'm not going to say there's too much too far I'm saying there are lots of risks here and in a world where you are literally identifying risks, let's identify the risks of the technology as much as the risks of the criminal actions and actors that are, are in the community. Has the computer ever gotten it wrong? Since you all have worked with this technology, have you had to make changes because the computer's got it wrong? I, I wouldn't say it's, it's gotten it wrong, per se, because it's, it's basically just develop, It's just creating areas of risk. So, uh, but to your point, uh, the technology is, is evolving, and I think it's great that we're having this dialogue, and it, I think it's something that we need to do more of. I think transparency is, is critical. We're a part of and empowered by the community. If the community told us, turn all this stuff off, we would have to turn it off. In Chicago, the community loves surveillance cameras. I've done talks in San Francisco and Seattle, and surveillance cameras are not even allowed on the public way in those two cities and probably others that I don't know about. In Chicago, we cannot move a camera because there's literal outcry from the community saying, where is my camera? Literally, in one hour, if a camera goes down for temporary repair, within one hour, I'm getting a call from either the alderman, which is the local elected official, or the district commander, or a community leader who are very, very active, and they literally say, I want my camera back. Where is it? Okay, with that, we're going to open it up to some questions from the audience here. And um, <coughs> we have mics that are making their way around the room. So we can include, if you have a question, please stand so they can see you and get that mic to you. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me at all? No. I think I heard you. Okay. Yeah. So I heard a lot of um, uh, risk factors were things like um, a, a shooting um, or a, a robbery or something like that. 
Can predictive policing do anything for crimes that happen within people's homes, like sexual assault? Um, Good question. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a great question, and in part, one of the dangers of focusing on the data you can see is you stop focusing on the data you can't see, right? So if this isn't that police are not doing those crimes or solving those crimes or caring about it, but it's a resource thing, right? If it's easier to find something that you can see, you measure what you can see, that's what happens, right? And so one of the realities is there's a whole chapter in the book called like no data, like where are the places that we can't see or we choose not to see, right? And, and domestic violence and sexual assault and certain kinds of trafficking cases are harder to see because they're not happening. In some ways, a lot of the, the original predictive policing uh, a focus on play space was all about crimes that for, some, for many people are ordinarily reported. So one of the companies that started this thing out, the one that got its you know, 2011 invention was something called Predpol. And they start out with three crimes, burglaries, car thefts, and theft from auto, in part because those tend to be fairly well reported because if you have insurance, you report it, right? And it's not so much like, was the police officer there to find an arrest for that? It was like, my car was stolen. Like, that's a data point, right? Mm. And that's not true with everyone because certain communities don't have insurance or certain communities so distrust the police, they won't call when their house is burglarized. But by and large, they thought, here's a set of uh, crimes that we can focus on and we can care. But of course, the attraction was, let's bring that out beyond those three property crimes into shootings and gang crimes, right? And, and the problem, as you get to, is that if, you're, if you lose focus, or, or if you, you become so myopic in your focus on the things you can see, you stop looking outside of it. And that's one of the dangers, right? This is the, the point that I think we really need to think about when I'm picturing these um, people on their smartphone. Like if you Google my name and something pops up, you assume that's correct. But that's based on the algorithms that we're creating to say that that is actually the most accurate thing, right? And that's what we're not interrogating. We're starting to interrogate in the consumer space that maybe Google has its own biases and it's pretty good. But if you ever use any of the other services, they're terrible. Like my computer defaults to Yahoo, and it is a worthless search engine. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely you useless. You need to switch to uh, Google. I in, do use in case Google anybody from Yahoo is watching. <laughs> it's useless. But again, to me, it shows like this isn't, you think it's because the data comes to you, you think that it's going to be automatic. And it's something that I would ask the chief about. Like, if I'm a hiring person, do I need different officers? If suddenly my officers are going to become data analysts and data inputters and data uh, 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 focused people, maybe the, the pool of people I want to bring into this profession might be different than the person who I would have hired 20 years ago. And what are we doing to sort of resource that and support that? And have we thought about that? Because we want officers to say, like, I have this data point, but there may be other things behind this that I haven't seen, and I don't want to not go to domestic violence calls because my computer told me not to go there. I want to be a critical thinker. I want to figure this stuff out. So one one uh, point to your question is that we do have a uh, we do have some risk factors for uh, households at risk for domestic violence, and just like the place based risk tool, they are exactly what you think they would be. And there's a, an assessment form that gets filled out. It's automated, uh, and that is uh, some. If the victim opts in to have information shared with a social service provider, that information, only if they agree to opt in, can be used to help provide intervention services and to help identify people and households at risk for domestic violence. And it's things like previous incidents of DV, uh, was a weapon used, you know, there, there's a, a variety of risk factors and they're pretty common sense things. Um, and then to your point about officers. so. The younger officers that we're hiring now, they, they expect that we have this kind of technology. So before we started this in 2017, the, the new officers that I would talk to would say, why don't we all have smartphones? Why aren't you using more analytics? Why don't you, because they're coming from that, that right. kind of background. So I think that's, that's going to be an evolution. I would imagine that in domestic violence cases that uh, the, the and I, I always say the women, but I know it's not just the women, but the, the victims of these incidents who are participating in things like information on exactly what happened to them and where they lived and the rest of this mm -hmm. would be women who don't have all of the resources that maybe some other women who could yes. slip out of the situation yes, exactly. would do yeah. without you know folks necessarily knowing um, that there may be some people who would need additional assistance. And I would imagine that that would tip the scales a bit to know where your uh, where the folks are who could be impacted by those kinds of crimes and exactly to that point the pilots that we're doing right now are in some of the areas that are that are have a lot of poverty and and don't always have the access to resources that s other parts of the city sometimes have yeah. NYPD also had an interesting pilot on domestic violence where there's unfortunately so many domestic violence incidents in New York that they couldn't have police go back and check the 
uh, people who were victims. And so they came up with an algorithm to try to figure, to prioritize who they're going to do the, the checks on, right? And they actually did a coded thing, again, of some of the words that were used in the narratives and stuff to predict that we know that domestic violence escalates and we know that certain people are more at risk, but we can't figure out who in the like 600,000 incidents a year there we should go back to and check on the, the woman who, who was victimized. And so they created an algorithm to try to prioritize based on data. Now, it might not be accurate, it might not be perfect, but it was something to try to use a tool, a, a technical tool, to be able to prioritize resources, which is kind of what's going on in a lot of these cases. Was that a list? Uh, it was a list. <laughs> okay, do we have another question from the audience? I'd like to thank the panelists, all of you, for, for being here. This is very informative, and I actually have two questions, if I might. One is to the professor. Does your uh, information, um, in terms of either parts or pieces or in whole, ever get uh, uh, either subject to uh, discovery motions or subpoenas? And my question to the chief is, uh, in terms of resources, I think you're sitting on a double-edged sword because once you get results, they say, well, you don't need any more resources, you're doing fine. And then the other edge of that sword is that you know that you need more resources. So. Um, how do you go about that dialogue, especially in something as big as Chicago, or maybe that's not your, your particular venue? And, and just a comment to the, to the Reverend, I'm sorry you had that experience. I mean, that's as bad as the cops coming up to you and saying, well, next time I have the chicken delivered. That, that was <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's start with the question about... Um, so I am just a law professor who sits at my desk and comes up with interesting ideas, so I rarely make it back into court. I was a trial lawyer at one point doing criminal defense, but I, I don't get subpoenaed. But I think there's actually an interesting issue of some of this data, right? So as much as all of this technology is sort of building networks of investigative power for police, it also is capturing exculpatory information, impeaching information. If you think about this network of big data surveillance things, you are capturing both things that are really helpful to your case and things that are not helpful to your case. And unless you code to be able to find both, you're going to be in a weird situation where you're going to know there is exculpatory information you're supposed to turn over to the defense, but you can't find it because you didn't build the system that way. And, and Manhattan DA's office right now is actually in that situation where they built this incredibly powerful, this again, the prosecutor's office, incredibly powerful networked um, investigative tool to be able to figure out who are their primary targets that they want to sort of uh, focus their prosecution resources, how they're connected, how they're networked. But no one, when they were building this architecture of investigative resources, thought about, you know, at some moment we're going to be in court. And someone there's maybe a defense lawyer is going to say, can I have the exculpatory information on this? Because you know about all the other rival gangs. You know about the other shootings. You know, like, did you figure, did you build your system so you could find that? And the answer I've gotten is like, nope, no one asked, right? And to me, that's not a, a thing that isn't solvable. But it's about who, when you ask these questions at the front end, you're literally building an architecture of surveillance. Can we think about these issues at the front end to avoid these back end problems that are, I won't say obvious, but are going to be? They're going to be issues of transparency, issues of bias, issues of accuracy, issues of efficiency and effectiveness. Like, we know that. Um, and what's unfair is we ask police. To, to answer those questions, uh, and we don't necessarily give them, you know, you get grants to get to put the things in place, not necessarily to think about how you should do it and all the concerns, right? And, and we ask you to do both, and then we criticize you when you don't do it all. Um, but that should be part of the conversation, right? To recognize all these going to have downstream consequences, and have we thought through those risks? That's what this is about, is thinking through risk. Um, because we're talking about flawed human beings who are creating systems. And what's, what are the systems going to check for? And we're talking about, to be honest, a system of social control and surveillance that has not been kind to communities of color. Like the history of law enforcement, sorry to say it here, has been a targeting of different techniques to poor communities and communities of color at the first time. And there's a real fear that we're also seeing surveillance being targeted in the same ways. Doesn't have to be that way. We're in a different city, you know, situation and world, sort of. Uh, but that has to be part of the conversation. We have to accept and embrace that there is distrust of law enforcement. And there's a reason for it. See the exhibits outside. And that we need to confront that to say that what we're doing here is a positive, not a negative, and you shouldn't be as scared. This isn't just going to be a way to justify locking up more people of color. Let's talk about resources. This is a very good point. When you're doing well, they don't think you need any more help. 
So that that is a decision that's made by the superintendent, the mayor, and the city council. So it's a little bit above my pay grade. I do go to the our, our budget hearings every year, uh, but I think it's safe to say that every community is always asking for more police. So I don't think we're going to see our budgeted numbers decrease. I think maybe someday maybe they'll increase. Who knows? But what I do think this information can do is help us to optimize the resources that we're allowed to have through the city council to be able to to be more precise about when and where we deploy them and how we use that's them. Question. Yes. Chick, question, when we talk about resources, also because you need so much resources for the technology mm -hmm. um, and there's only but so much pie, how does that affect um, the money or the kind of resources put on community policing? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, this is expensive. Uh, the shot spotter alone is going to be about $8 million a year to sustain. Uh, we've gotten a lot of private foundation uh, donations to help with the technology. Um, some grants, uh, like the, the subject model is grant funded. A lot of the evaluations that we're doing, that RAND is doing, that's all grant funded. Uh, and those foundations are also funding some community policing efforts. Uh, the city council has given us resources to provide a lot more police officers on the street, which helps with community policing. Um, so we're hoping that these can all work together and that, that one doesn't suffer because of the other. Wow. I'm thinking if we just put more money in the front end of education. <coughs> it could really help on the back end of these things, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, yes. Hi there. Uh, professor, I, I do live in downtown Baltimore. I'm familiar with the eye in the sky. And I helped put the domain awareness system together in New York City, so I'm very familiar with that. But I have an interesting question because, uh, as, as Jonathan mentioned, um, I'm a Peelian as well in the principles of, of Peelian policing. And one of them is the police of the community and the community of the police. And I, I personally felt, and I've written on this, that police are always called in when all the other city services fail whether it's education, yeah. public work, social services, business and economic development. So police, a lot of, a lot of uh, duties are placed on police that probably need to be rethought. Mm -hmm. So the technology behind what Jonathan's doing is about risk identification and trying to save that, which actually, I won't mention the city, but another chief in another city in the Midwest built something like this in the uh, 1999 and the sergeant who was running it identified a list of 28 individuals in that city was basically the hit list. These people were gonna die. Mm -hmm. And he brought it to the chief. And what do you think the chief said? <laughs> Get the list out of here. By the time he brought it to the chief, one was dead and one was already in, 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 in a critical condition in the hospital. So this technology can save lives. The question is at what point maybe do we give communities the ability to identify the risks themselves so that the police are focusing on the, the, the more intense problems in the city, and the communities um, bring their responsibilities to the table equally, as Robert Peel suggests. I mean, I, I sort of joke that the problem with predictive policing is the policing <coughs> part, right? That the idea of risk identification in communities and the fact of approaching violence as a public health problem makes a lot of sense, right? We can identify people who are more at risk. We can intervene in that way. But what has happened is that the funding streams either through NIJ, either through grants, has been to police because we do think police can solve these problems. And when you are a chief and you have strapped resources and you're given a grant, you don't necessarily say, you know who should have this health and human services, so let them handle this, right? Because you're not gonna get that money back. And, and then you ask, then you say to the chiefs, well, why are you the ones being the f face of social services? Like that's you know, a disconnect to the people who have grown up not trusting police and the answer is because there's no one else and that creates a necess a, a real tension uh, there's again there's a whole chapter in my book called bright data that is basically like can we take the same risk identification piece this public health approach and reshape it to uh, improve uh, sort of the community control of this um, again that will I would say disempower police will just mean less control over police, uh, but it means trying to do the same things. Now, that too will be critiqued by people who say, well, now you're targeting, you know, truants and or people who don't have, who are like food insecure and why, you know, and, and that's a real concern too because we've seen that same discrimination in some of the social services programs. But I think that one of the problems is that we've tasked police not only to do the impossible in so many other cases, but also here to focus all their resources as this is a policing model, right? This is about pol their police officers and civilians who are trying to keep things secure, not thinking of the larger public safety issues that we know are driving 
um, crime. And again, like, if you ask any chief of police, like, what's your answer to crime? The real answers of, you know, better schools, more hope, more education, more jobs, all this stuff, like, they don't get to control. But if you're told, like, hey, we got this new fancy tech thing that's going to make you feel safer, that's an easy sell. That's why it wins in a lot of times. And it's not that it's wrong, because police are going to police anyway, right? And you might as well have smarter police. You might as well have people who know more as they're doing this. And like, that's what we do in every other industry. Why would we not have police be smarter? But we have to do it wisely. We have to think about that there are differences in this sort of public space, social, uh, social safety space, or public safety space, uh, than in other places. But also, I think I talked about that around how Prince George's County was re-looking at how it shapes government um, and its relationship to police department, which yeah. transform a neighborhoods initiative. That that was about, let us look at these hot spots, let us look at these pieces. Now, what Prince George's County is doing now with a new county executive is that they're realizing, okay, we had done that just for hot spots, but we realized that there were people in other locations who had similar needs that because they weren't in hot spots, quote unquote, that they weren't able to get this kind of service approach. And so now Prince George's County is taking that model and expanding it to the whole county uh, to then deal just with needs um, and people who kind of meet certain criteria of needs to then be able to kind of do to offer those kinds of services. Um, and it really does not necessarily have to take more money, it just has to take more efficient government um, and more efficiently being able to use what's already there to be able to just direct the services to where they need to go. You brought up a point earlier when you said education, <coughs> and it, of course, it's true. The areas that, that have a lot of poverty also unfortunately have a lot of crime and also unfortunately often don't have the same kinds of job opportunities, don't have the same kinds of good schools often, sometimes don't even have their food deserts, they don't even have access to nutritious food. You have a, uh, unemployment, you have you know maybe single parent households, not that that's intrinsically bad, but you maybe don't have the family support that you have. Uh, that that this, this needs to be a comprehensive program of support for communities that need it the most and in, in some places Unfortunately, this is going to take a long time because these are these are chronic these communities the south side and the west side of Chicago have chronically have the highest crime for decades and decades and decades. What's interesting, so the police are doing to your point, we want to do what we can do. We want to be the best at, at what we can do. We think this technology is helping us do that. We know that it's having an impact. The the seventh district, Inglewood on the south side of Chicago, that accounted for a a, a lot of the gun violence in the city. Seven and eleven, two districts where we started this, accounted for twenty five percent of the gun violence in Chicago in twenty sixteen. They were driving the violence up. They're now driving it down. So we know that just the police, just with these tools, working with the community, but we can do all this. Now imagine what you could do if you started addressing some of these deep-rooted problems and actually making some systemic change in some of these communities, maybe you could have zero crime. And that's my question for you. Would it be the arresting that's making the difference, or would it be no, the wraparound services that wrap are going along services. with the So we, we can show in the University of Chicago, uh, which is our partner in this effort, the crime lab there, has done some research to show that we, our arrests are not going up. So it's not a it's not an enforcement activity that's making the difference. It's community policing. It's being in the right places. It's being proactive. It's intervening. It's doing things to try to reduce the chance that somebody's going to be victimized at all. And it's not an arrest model. It's not an enforcement model. And believe me, you know there are some bad cops, just like there are some bad doctors and there are some bad professors. You're not one of them, but there are some. <laughs> good. You can ask my students. Uh, we are we are the good cops are offended and disgusted by racist cops. I grew up in Chicago. I went to a high school that was 75% African American. My best friend and I went to a suburban shopping mall when we were in high school. We got stopped on the way back into the city by a suburban cop who took us out of the car, put us on the ground, uh, put us back in the car and said, you're not coming back into this suburb. I was personally offended and disgusted by, by that officer's conduct and any good cop would be. Another question. I have a question. Yes. Uh, my question has to do with the data that's feeding this. And I understand, I think what you're doing is brilliant and, uh, and it makes a lot of sense. It's very logical. But w to what extent do you use, are, are you moving towards using anything that's very real time? So it's historical data, right? With the exception of shot spotters, probably pretty yeah. close to real time. But are there any of the platforms um, that incorporate or layer in, for example, social media data? 
Uh, social media is an area that the professor will confirm has a is fraught with privacy concerns. Um, there was an ACLU California agreement with some of the social media content aggregators that essentially um, put one company that was a Chicago-based company out of business. So we, not that we would want to, but we cannot get some of that social media data. So that does not come into our platform. You could if you're creative, but we're, we're not. Of course, we have some units that are doing, you know, some pretty intense investigations that have subpoenas that are, you know, using criminal predicate to get at, with court orders to get at social media data, and we're doing some open source. But that's not a key component of these strategic centers. But what is, to your point about uh, using information in a real time way? So certainly, cameras are used in a real time way. Shot spotter is near instantaneous. Calls for service, you know. So there, are citizen tips that come into us. So part of what AI will be able to do in the future is help fuse these sources of information together to provide more actionable content to, to direct field resources and intervene. That is an interesting point because how many crimes have we seen that if folks were paying more attention to what was going on on the social media mm -hmm. could have been prevented? We had the Annapolis shootings here. Yep. Where are and they are. I mean, you, are, you know, unfortunately the reality is, you know, the dumb things that youth used to do in the real world, which they still are doing, they're also now on social media doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a wise detective, you're paying attention to YouTube and seeing who's hanging with whom. You are paying attention to the public Facebook and Twitter feeds because kids aren't too smart about keeping it quiet. Uh, and so there is this world of watching. And the question is, does that associational link uh, create suspicion in any way? Are there checks of it? You know, you have gang units whose job it is to figure out who's in a gang and who's doing what and who's shooting and who, right? And all of the clues are sort of available, right, in the sense of you wouldn't necessarily handicap them. But you have to be careful, right? Because a lot of the times you just get uh, you, you, you get sloppy or you get marked as you were, you were in a YouTube video with a guy we know is in a gang and suddenly you're a part of it. And this is a problem with data. It's like data sort of, unless there are uh, mechanisms to like cleanse it or make sure it's accurate, it just gets sloppy. And you can be connected to, way, to something that you might have been connected to but not really in the same way. And suddenly someone three steps down the line gets this information say, oh, well, they're connected to this gang, so they must be this gang. And that's a problem because we haven't figured out the ways to take this overwhelming amount of information and be good about getting good data. Like other companies and other entities cleanse their data and they cure their data and they try to figure out whether it's bad data because they don't want to be investing or buying the wrong products because who wants to buy a whole bunch of the wrong products? And we just don't always have the resource, police don't have the resource to do it. Uh, and it's hard because it's a constantly evolving fire hose of information. Uh, but it has real impacts because you can get associated with uh, something that you probably are not directly associated with, but you can get sort of tagged as part of the criminal activity. Interesting. Yes. So, Chief, you'd mentioned a couple times about resources and also about the police being slightly behind in terms of catching up to technology. And so my question is, you mentioned that there's people in the education field and also in the police field that are working on this technology. Has there ever been any thought given to opening this up to like general public help. For instance, like the federal government has a facet through challenge.gov where they can open up challenges to people to create technology that the government can then use. Mm -hmm. So as a way to open it up to the community to help, is it something that has ever been thought about to potentially do that to open up this idea yeah. of creating a better predictive police data force, so to speak, through public um, help? I think that's a great idea. Um, if you go to uh, data.cityofchicago.org, you will find about 600 data sets that the city puts out there on tons of stuff. And one of, one of the data sets is crime data in Chicago to a pretty granular level. Every crime that's reported uh, aggregated to the block level, but it's all there. Uh, we work with a lot of academics, and we point them to that uh, data set, and we say, have at it, and try to try to see what you can do with it. And some of them come back and say, hey, we've done this. Do you want to look at it? We look at it. We've also done a couple of hackathons, uh, mostly with Chicago Public Schools. We have a STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math program, and we've had high school students come in and create some really innovative uh, prototypes for us to look at. But opening it up on a more broad basis to the community, I think, is a great idea. Any more questions? So, I can probably speak loud enough. I, um, I'm curious, and it's probably directed kind of to Chief, but in terms of unintended, unintended consequences with place-based predictions, so you have 
resources being allocated to maybe a ward or a district, and then next thing you know, the crime's going down there, but the adjacent district or maybe jurisdictions outside the city are experiencing crime increases that may no longer in your data, but now these unintended consequences are happening. Are you keeping track of that? Or are you we are, and, and right now the way that the, the resources are allocated by district don't really change based on the predictive models, at least not yet. I could see someday maybe that happening. But as you can imagine, it's a uh, very, very uh, sensitive uh, public issue where the district I live in, for example, is along the lakefront, it's pretty low crime. And my aldermen and district commander are always talking about ensuring that that district gets the resources it needs but at the same time balancing the needs of some of the busier districts which are primarily south and west side. Um, so right now it's used primarily within district boundaries to be more precise about how those resources are allocated within the districts in terms of times and places and activities. Uh, but I could see a day where that, that could start becoming an issue, yes. Okay, well, no more questions from the audience. So final thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. One more question. Okay. Do you like the mic? Oh, no, that's fine. Oh, okay. You're talking Sorry. about intervention and risk factor. Uh, so, two things. Do you measure, when intervention does occur, do you measure the result of that? And then who who's protecting the intervener if it's not the police? Uh, good question. So on the on the evaluation side, uh, Rand did a an initial evaluation of our first version of the list, yeah. uh, which was um, not real positive, so we invited them back, and people said, well, why are you inviting them back? They did a evalu bad evaluation. Because we want to, we know they're going to be objective. So they're now evaluating the new model, and they're evaluating the SDSCs. So we're looking forward to some results. Hopefully they'll publish, and then it takes a while to peer review with uh, with some of these agencies. But hopefully within a year or less, we'll see some, some of their uh, results. And then we do send uh, police with the social service providers. Uh, it's not the police knocking on the door like they would be doing a search warrant. It's the social service provider there doing the primary interaction, but the police are there as for safety. All right, so let's have some final thoughts, starting with Reverend Lee, and I'll we'll walk, work our way down here. Um, one, thank you for this conversation. Um, thank you to Law Enforcement Museum. This has um, been a great conversation. Um, Chief, thank you for the work you do. Professor, thank you for your book. Um, I will be buying it on Amazon very soon. <laughs> Big data will know that you exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my final thoughts would be, um, I just want to reiterate the importance of community being part of the conversation on the front end. Um, I, I just think that's very important, and I think it's important for two reasons. One, I think it can inform the police department, but I also think that it can help the community as a community grapples with trust issues um, from over the years. Because even though these things have been happening over the years, um, over the years, community has had challenges. Um, and so, and I, and I thank you, sir, for sharing what you shared. Um, a very interesting thing for me is, you know, as you shared that, I thought about the fact that, you know, the times I've had guns pointed at me, um, have been by police and have been when I was an innocent citizen, you know, like once about, you know, so, and, 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 and so that is what causes this stuff in many ways when you're talking about place-based stuff to scare me. But I have to acknowledge that's just a fear that comes with what it's meant to kind of grow up in the way I have. Um, but I've been an innocent citizen in those kinds of spaces. I can picture what it means to be in a neighborhood that has been, you know, shown to have crime and then, you know, kind of be innocent and still get caught up in the mix. And so I think that it's important for the police department to hear that from citizens, but I also think, and it was very helpful for me to hear your perspective in this because it helped me in my, and even as I think about this stuff. Um, and so that's my, that's my thought. Thank you, Chief. Well, I want to echo the Reverend's comments. Uh, <coughs> thanks to everybody for having us here and to Target and the, the museum and to all of you for coming. And I think the community is absolutely critical. I agree with you 100%. Uh, we've learned some lessons with the early version of, of the list. One is never to call it a list. Uh, but this is an, it's an evolution. We're going to continue to grow and improve, and, and the community is going to be critical to, to making that happen. And without the community support, we can't, we can't operate, we can't exist. Uh, so I think that the dialogue and dialogues like this and transparency are 
critically important. Uh, Chicago is implementing a lot of uh, improvements, a lot of changes. Uh, some of them as a result of um, some things in the in the DOJ report that we didn't agree with, but that we are still working to correct. You're seeing huge investments in training, obviously technology, things like body-worn cameras with 8,000 officers now equipped with body-worn cameras and probably more to come. So I think it's an evolution and, and it's something that we, we need the public support to, to be effective with. So, you know, we're at the beginning of an important conversation in America because what you saw and what you see in Chicago is going to come to every other city. Um, it will happen, and it will happen in good ways and bad ways. And if we don't have these conversations now, I think we risk more bad ways than good ways. I think if we actually have these conversations, we can get ahead of these problems, because it's not rocket science. It might be complicated algorithms, but the actual underlying issues are things that we, we can me uh, measure and master. And like, you know, I, I sort of frame this issue as like, all big data policing has like a black data problem, black in three ways, right? One is you have to confront race. You cannot deal with policing in America in most major cities without confronting race. And like you have to recognize that some of this data is going to be encoded with racial bias. And you got to be able to overcome that. We can do that actually with data and algorithms. We actually do it all the time. Uh, but we have to be conscious that we need to do it. Part of blindness is the, the transparency issue, right? We are dealing with um, a system that is by and large not only not transparent, but even if you showed the algorithm, you showed the stuff, you still wouldn't understand it, right? Uh, and you have to deal with police who have had to be sued and demanded and complained to actually get some of this information out in a transparent way, which has only served, I think, to, to, to undermine the, the approach. When you are transparent, you explain it, it actually really isn't that scary. But if you don't explain it, it feels a lot scarier. And the fact that every conversation begins with Minority Report just gets to the point. Like, it, it, it isn't that. And it isn't going to be that. But we need to get over it. And part of it's also thinking about the law. We haven't spent time thinking about how these technologies will distort privacy on the streets, distort Fourth Amendment rights of citizens there, change use of force if you know people are you know, in high crime areas or predicted areas or, or, or individuals who high, have high risk scores. It's going to change how police see them. And these are all conversations and ideas that we could have, but we haven't been having. Uh, and I thank you all and the National Law Enforcement Museum to begin to have this conversation because there are, what, 18,000 law enforcement agencies in America. There are lots of major cities where this conversation aren't having. And we really should be putting together to realize that we can get ahead of this problem if we put our heads together ahead of time. Uh, and that's what we need to do. So thank you for being part of that conversation and that dialogue. And thank you for excellent moderating. It's wonderful. Oh, thank uh, you. And thank you all for, for being here. Thank you.